Well, um, hello everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Ricardo. I'm the director of the uh, Global Mental Health Center here at IOP. And um, as you know, this is uh, we're very uh, privileged um, to have Kenji with us today. This is, um, we are celebrating 10 years, our 10 years anniversary this year of the center. And uh, the center is, um, um, for those of you who don't know it, is a very successful enterprise, if we can put it that way. Um, it's a place where most of the um, people who um, get paid, you know, are producing the most important work in global mental health, or pain, or pass through our corridors. Um, we have a tremendously successful you know, teaching initiative in the center. Um, we have a very successful NSC, and of course, you know, uh, and, and my employers would be delighted to hear. We raise vast amounts of money in terms of research funding. Um, so anyway, we are celebrating uh, um, our 10th um, anniversary with a number of uh, series of lectures. And um, uh, this is one of them. If you want to know more about the uh, our lectures, you can visit our website, or you can put your name down in our mailing list, and we'll keep you informed. Um, so this is our second lecture, um, and we are really truly privileged to have here Kenji uh, with our most recent acquisition, expanding on the global health at King's College. Um, uh, he will probably, Kenji is the best person to present himself. Uh, but um, just to say that he's a, a, a director of the um, policy health unit now, the institute, right? Population Health Institute. Population Health Institute <coughs> at King's College. Uh, but Kenji trained in Japan uh, and subsequently did his PhD at Harvard, I believe. And uh, before he uh, joined lots of very important organizations, including the World Health Organization, and obviously Mark has continued to contribute to his own country, like most of us, you know, who have come to the uh, here in the UK. Um, and uh, he has, um, I would say, can't you that uh, he's going to talk us about challenges in public health, but there were two things that he put in his uh, description of the lecture that attracted my attention and number one it was the word revolution and number two it was the word tsunamis. <laughs> uh, I said to him, you know, those two things are very common to the country where I came from. <laughs> I came originally. And also we, we hate cold weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we both hate cold weather. But I was trying to convince Kinky that this year has been incredibly warm. <laughs> so prepare yourself for the rest. So, Anyway, um, I'll um, leave you with uh, Kenji, and so without much further ado, please. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Ricardo, for inviting me. Um, my name is Kenji. I, um, I just joined King's a uh, few weeks ago, so I don't know anything about the King's. So this is my first lecture, uh, because Ricardo was asking me to present uh, what I have done since last September. So it was a great opportunity to be here at the IOPPN, a mecca of global mental health. So in my presentation today, I'd like to talk about uh, the future health systems. Uh, so people are, is, uh, people are asking me what I'm going to do at the Population Health Institute. But this topic is highly related to my vision for the Institute. But before doing so, I'd like to uh, introduce myself. Ricardo did a very formal <laughs> introduction, but I'd like to self-introduce who I am, because very few people know about me. So, who is Kenji? Um, <laughs> actually, when I was a med student, I dropped out. So I went to uh, Southern Ireland by bicycle, and then I fly to uh, Jamaica to do a music lesson. <laughs> And then I traveled India, as some of you have already done. But um, basically, I got lost. And so I was not sure what I should do as a um, medical personnel. 
But one day in Calcutta, um, the guy staying at the very, very dirty dormitory uh, brought, me, brought me to this place. Uh, it's very famous, which is called Missionary of Charity, also known as Mother Teresa's House. I was not interested in charity at all, and I didn't care about this kind of stuff. But in the end, I stayed there for three months, I think. I, I saw lots of people dying and, and bumped on the street and brought to here and died with dignity. And there was a huge social injustice and inequality and poverty everywhere. So I got lost in med school, not because of my ignorance, but because of my indifference. So indifference was my fundamental problem. And obviously, indifference to these social issues are uh, common enemies. So I went back to med school and obtained my MD and studied as an ER doctor. I was practicing. I was not just researching, number crunching, but I was, you know, seeing the patient in the ER. And in 1994, uh, some of you might have remembered, there was a massive genocide in Rwanda. And I went there as a medical officer. It was my first time to have an experience in this kind of humanitarian disaster. But probably one of the worst ones. I saw 1,000 patients and who are dying from cholera, measles, malaria, or obviously pregnancy-related conditions. I tried to do whatever I could day and night. But I just wonder why these things happened to the kids and the mothers there. And what went wrong? And what I could do? That was the beginning of my journey in population health. So when I, I, I went back, and I was working at the uh, intensive care unit, and one day at the night shift, I was reading a new report uh, published by the World Bank, uh, which, was the, which was called World Development Report, 1993, long time ago. Um, investing health. The theme was investing health. It was quite eye-opening because um, the report proposed from access to health outcome and more focus on adult health, not just the mother and child health. And also they said treatment could be very cost effective. And finally they insist that health is not just a cost, it's an investment. It's quite new to me because I, I'm, a, I'm trained as a just a doctor, MD. But these economists, you know, I, it was the first time for me to think economy as an economist. You know, they focus on outcome, they focus on the efficiency, they will focus about the return on investment. We tend to talk about access, prevention, also you know, some sort of justice, which is very fundamental. But also, it was quite eye-opening for me so I checked who wrote this, and back on the page, I found the PI was the guy called Chris Murray at Harvard. So I sent a fax. I didn't have it at that time. We didn't have this. So I wrote a fax, and he replied by fax, and why don't you just come? So I, I, I bought a ticket, and I went to see him. And he was very young, and he was um, three or four years ahead of me. But we liked math. Uh, we discussed uh, substantially, and we became a good friend even now. So I joined his team. Uh, of course, I, I get a lot of the PhD program. So that was the beginning of my work on this Birdham disease study. And it was, uh, we started in a very tiny garage, um, which was used for the storage of newspapers by Harvard Crimson Magazine. And it was just five of, five of us, Chris, myself, uh, somebody from the World Bank, uh, Indian Research Fellow, and one undergrad, five of us. But now, as you probably you know, it's a huge enterprise in Seattle, 450 people funded by Gates Foundation. I often used to visit that office, but it's not so exciting to me. The, at the time when we started with five people, it was most most fun, you know exciting time. So I hope that my history will provide this kind of excitement to some of you. 
And I went back to Tokyo after getting a PhD and started my career as an assistant professor of health economics. But one day, at 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, Chris, who moved to WHO, waked me up and said, Kenji, come to Geneva. I have asked your government to second you. So I said, because I went back, I started my career, and in my mind, I am sick of working with you. So I don't want to work with you anymore. But, he, but the government in the, in the morning at 8 a.m., the health, health ministry guy called me up and, Dr. Sibia, you are supposed to go to Geneva. <laughs> so I said, well, it's my, my it's okay. So I joined WHO and, and then there, as a chief of policy, I did lots of stuff with colleagues across the globe. Now I served three DGs, uh, Dr. Brundtland, who, who, who was the Norwegian Prime Minister, and then Dr. J.W. Lee, who was a Korean, and this lady, Margaret Chan. And I did great things, personally, but also I did a terrible mistake. And I was almost fired by this lady next to Margaret. Because I wrote a, a paper with Chris and other academic member in the Lancet. Actually, uh, uh, it was not my intention, but uh, the paper criticized substantially so the way WHO, UNICEF produce numbers. Because they, you know, for example, I can tell you right now. So we are doing some sort of coordinating mechanism about, for example, under five mortality. So country by country estimation process is there. So we do some regression model, whatever that is. And then when it comes to the agreement, some say, the guy from music, oh, this number will definitely, you know, make that country, you know, angry. So we have to scale it down a little bit. And the other guy said, oh, no, no, we, we, oh, yeah, this, this number is really, uh, yeah, out, out right, yeah, we should drop it. So this kind of triangulation is becoming a norm of this kind of international consensus building. So, I, 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 so when I first attended this meeting, we cannot continue to be held accountable if you continue like this. So I'm very, very angry about this kind of process. Of course, the process is important. Consensus building is definitely important. But at the time, I was not, I was a really fresh out of PhD, and um, I thought this is not a good thing for WHO in, in the long run. So uh, we came up with a new model. Uh, it's not a super duper health statistics unless, but it's a simple, um, you know, Rosia regression model which is now used as a common standard method for under five mortality. But uh, the paper actually criticized the way WHO produced the, the number. So Margaret, actually UNICEF, the head of UNICEF called Margaret, who is this Shibuya? Who is this Kenji? Why don't you just fire him? So, <laughs> seriously. So, and Margaret called me up and then so she said, why did you do this? Yeah, because this, this number, all, all, you know, went not so, not so good. So we have to be held accountable. And, and then the, day, the, the next day, Richard Holden, you know, Richard Holden Lancet called me. If Margaret fire you, I write editorial. I said, please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, there are a few people uh, supporting what I did. One is the ex-president of Gates Foundation, Tachi Yamada, and he called me up. So I, I, I told him uh, he was one of my mentors, and he still is. But he, he said, so I, I told him, I have decided to quit because I screwed up. I did a terrible thing to DG and WHO. But he said, no, no, you did a great thing, right thing, but longly, in a long way. And if you, if you quit now, Everybody thinks that you did it intentionally to damage WHO. So he says, stay one year, whatever happens, and then move. So I, I you know, kept his promise. And after my year, I quit WHO to go back to Japan. And uh, I became a professor. And also I did a bunch of director institute for global health policy, which is a think tank of the Japanese government. 
and also executive advisor to health minister. But again, what I did sounds fancy, but actually not fancy at all. But a bunch of housekeeping of Japanese domestic and global health policy. And I didn't realize until I engaged in these activities the importance of the interaction between science, politics, and the social movement to make a difference. The science is critical, but without politics, the policy making process, and also social movement, it's very difficult to make a difference. And of course, I had my startups because um, you know, some of the stuff the uh, government doesn't want to do. And also, I was advisor to venture capital. I have uh, I had a few different hats. I do research. I do policy making, not necessarily politics, and engage in social movement. So essentially, I don't have a real plan in my life. I got interested in something, and I do my best to achieve the goals. And something shows up, I dive into something else, and I'm here today. <laughs> so perhaps some of the psychiatrists, psychiatrists sitting in this room may call me hyperactive, maybe two. So anyway, um, how many of you know this man? This man. Uh, how many of you have read this book? Who is this? Huh? Huh? Very famous guy. Unfortunately, he died a couple of years ago. And Hans, when I was at WHO, you know Hans, if you Google Hans, and there are a bunch of great videos, uh, his TED Talks. But he's a guy, he's a statistician, he's an MD. He used to work at the Karolinska Institute. And he's a nerd to create something called Gapminder. And he's, a, he's full of a sense of humor. But Gapminder software, is tr he's trying to bring, bridge the gap between meaningless numbers, and also the meaning of in the real world. So he, he brought me, he showed me the prototype of this gap miner. It's just a bubble, visualization data. Everybody can do it today, but 20 years ago, nobody could do it. I was very surprised to see it. Because it, was, it was the first time, because I, I was producing a bunch of numbers at WHO. And he said, oh, how many people will read this? How many people will understand this kind of stuff? And he showed this kind of bubble thing, visualization. So I, I was very impressed. I gave a very, very small grant to him because WHO doesn't have money. And in the end, after 10 years, he sold the Gapminder to Google. And he made a fortune. And so later, I, I became an advisor to venture capital. I really regret. I should have invested more. But anyway. Using that money, I mean, he doesn't have to care about his life, so he you know, traveled around, made a bunch of lectures. But all, I really admire him because he, b just before he died, he went to Sheron, uh, Liberia, as an advisor to president and, uh, in the middle of the Ebola crisis. And when he had a, you know, a cancer, uh, he came to Japan to test the new drugs, and we spent some time before he passed away. But I, I like to, uh, this is not a point, I like to do some tests for you because uh, I'm a professor and uh, one of the tasks of the professor is to uh, assess your knowledge and under understanding of the issues. And I took this from, you know, this factfulness, very good book, you should, have, you should read it. Every time, um, you know, Hans goes for lecture, he uses a series of questions. And most of the time, the smartest Harvard grad kid, or even Oxford, or you know, in the Institute of Technology, most of them didn't pass that test. So let's 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 give it a try. <laughs> Here at IOPPN, very simple questions. One is, what proportion of adults in the world can read and write? Here, adult means at those age 15 to 60. Is adult literacy rate? So how many of you think that on global average, of course, population weighted, okay? So that are literacy rate. There are countries from Sub-Saharan Africa to UK, European countries, United States, so population weighted average. How many of you think that what, around 45%? How many of you think 45%? 
No, it's, it's, it's not a serious test, but <laughs> don't, don't, you know, you have to be confident, so 45%. Yes? What year was this taken from? What? What year was this Let's say now. Yeah, well, it's a good question, but, yeah, uh, you know, currently, just, just a laugh number. <laughs> it's very important to be strict, but 45%. Be confident. 65? 85. Okay. Next one. This is very simple. What is the average life expectancy of the world population? This is IOPPN. You are working in the health sector, so you should know this. Again, it's population weighted average of life expectancy in the world. 55. 65. 75. Okay. Next one is also simple. What is the proportion of one year kids in the world are vaccinated against measles? Measles vaccination coverage among infants. Simple. But it's, it's really tricky. You need a syringe. You need a cold chain. You need a quality vaccine to be available to these kids. That includes, you know, Sierra Leone, Liberia, sub saharan Africa, population weighted vaccine coverage of measles. 25% to start with. Be confident. No, no, seriously. How many? Okay, one third. 55. All right? 85. Okay. Last one. So this is a trajectory of a number of kids. Not kids, no. Adolescent. Age 0 to 15. So what's the you know, projection, project number of kids under age 15. So this is the real data, it's a real data. We are about here. This is the business as usual scenario. No more increase. This is somewhere in between. So how many of you think that, yeah, we will increase, we will continue to increase like this, A. Because, you know, fertility rate in Sub-Saharan Africa is not still plateau. So, A, a B, and C? Okay, four questions. Other data rate, 85%. World population, 75 years. Tim, you said, you, are, you know a bunch of genetic information. Why you don't know this? <laughs> <laughs> 75. And vaccine coverage, 85. No more increase in kids. Surprising, it's a simple question. But hand thrusting is a very, very, you know, and, you know, he was convinced that we don't know much about this. Right, so world is changing very rapidly. Sorry, I spent so, so much time introducing by myself and also testing your knowledge. But don't be discouraged, this is quite good <coughs> compared to my test in Tokyo or at Harvard. So today I'm going to talk about just three things in the next 20 minutes or so. First, health system are changing towards social system, particularly in aging society like Japan. And the second, I would like to argue both local and global population health share common issues in many countries, not just developed countries, but also in developing countries. And finally, I'd like to discuss the future of health systems and share my vision for the new Institute for Population Health. So where I was working at WHO headquarters, I said bad things about WHO, but I love WHO, seriously. It's a love and hate relationship. And we wrote a very controversial World Health Report 2000. You know, some of you may you know about uh, uh, these controversies. Focusing on the performance of health systems. We did it intentionally because we want to put health system on the top of the agenda. Before that, WHO was focusing on, for example, malaria, maternal child health, or measles, very, very vertical. So the new Director General, Dr. Brunton, wanted to put health system high on the agenda. And we used a very quantitative approach and ranked each member state on the basis of its performance. And luckily, Japan ranked number one. According to our analysis, not my analysis, okay? <laughs> According to WHO's analysis. But the report evoked huge, huge controversy in the debate. 
because we don't have data. How did you make this kind of stuff? We did lot, lots of extrapolation, imputation, you know, despite limited information available from poor resource <laughs> setting. But uh, controversy uh, actually contribute to the debate. It's like a viral marketing today. <laughs> and the HSS became one of the most important health policy agenda today, after 10 years from this publication, and 20 years from this publication. But this report was a political disaster to Dr. Brundtland because, for example, the United States, Brazil, or South Africa, or other diplomatically very strong countries were ranked low as opposed to their expectation, and they were furious about it. So here again, we can observe an interaction between science, politics, and social movement, at WHO and everywhere. In 2011, when you know, Ricardo mentioned about tsunami and big earthquake, I read the Lancet series on Japan, and Richard Horton wrote in his editorial that Japan is a mirror of our future. And he is sometimes very serious, and he doesn't do some lip services, and I think what he wrote in the editorial was real. And if we look across the countries, the health system in the world today, there are four big tsunamis. This was in Dr. Tedros, new director general of WHO speech. Uh, one is population aging. Second is chronic disease. Chronic disease is not just non-communicable disease, which includes mental health, but also communicable diseases like HIV are becoming chronic. And also explosion of health technologies. Up to 40% of inappropriate use of technologies. Mm -hmm. Challenges of intellectual property rights. And of course, highly, pr pr highly priced innovative drugs everywhere. And globalization. It's not just, a, you know, bacterial viruses, not just AMR, but also human resources, information, and resources, globalization everywhere. And the Japan is the fastest aging population here, yeah. as you know. But the problem is, is that other Asian countries or other countries in the world are catching up very quickly. The gravity of the rate of aging is very steep, in particular in Asia. And fourth tsunami hit Japan more acutely. And as a cover of the economists articulated here, Japan is not only aging, but also shrinking. And in fact, Japanese population began to fall since 2004. And the proportion of age 65 increased from 12% in 1990 to 27% in 2015. So we have a big problem. Everybody says it's a big problem, but, but what to do? And after nearly 20 years since the publication of World Health Report 2000, Japanese officials still quote the WHO report and saying, oh, we are, we are number one in terms of health system. So I said I was very skeptical. And as someone who actually did that analysis, I revisited the issue and focused on the subnational analysis again in terms of Japanese health system performance, uh, which was published in Lancet as well. And in 2013, the government set two major goals, extending healthy life expectancy, that's one, but also reducing health inequality. But our analysis in this paper suggested that really opposite directions. So there is a stagnation in the improvement in healthy life expectancy, but also widening gaps Across, across prefecture, prefecture is a state. So why did inequality get worse? Oh, of course, we could hypothesize many things. One is, you know, probably difference, differences in individual risk factor distribution by prefecture, or differences in resources by prefecture, doctors, medical expenditure, or efficiency of that resource use by prefecture, or social determinants, many, many hypotheses. But we, t we are testing this by simple uh, analysis about risk factor distribution, uh, proximal risk factor distribution uh, is, uh, didn't have uh, enough exp explanatory power 
to expand regional variation. So as, uh, as shown here, this is the expenditure and number of doctors, and also this is the standardized death rate or diaries, disability just life use. And each point is perfect. But no correlation. Of course, it's a very simple analysis. But politically, there was a huge debate. Widening gap, lots of politicians and you know, try to attribute the gap to results of differences. Oh, this prefecture, we don't have many doctors, nurses. We don't have enough resources. So please give it them to us. That's a kind of political battle. But my analysis suggests it's not necessarily the case. So we are now testing more on the efficiency and performance of um, health sector uh, you know, in each prefecture given the resource input or social determinants thing by using a bunch of data set. And, but the more I engage in this sort of burden disease analysis, which I studied with Chris 20 years ago, the more I realize is fundamental limitations. That is, the current GBD approach doesn't capture and to understand the individual population interactions. You know, that's fundamental. Because of course, GBD is a great approach to grab a big picture on the population average phenomenon, but that is not enough. In the end, what matters is not just the risk profile of a group of individuals, but how each individual behaves and make a particular choice given the bunch of variables surrounding him or her. It's an old but new question in the era of sustainable development goals, in the era of no one left behind. We are talking about SDGs, no one left behind, but we are just talking about the average numbers, population phenomenon. But the more I understand, the more I try to re realize the why, what we should do, I end up thinking about more about the individual population interaction. So that's an old and but new question to me. So through this experience over the past five or six years, I got more interested in social transformation of the health system. Rather than the number crunching, I don't say number crunching, but it's important, and the exploration of the GBD approach, which I still do, but I see lots of limitations. So I did, to summarize, I did World Health Report in 2000, and I did Lancet Seas 2011, and I did some national mm -hmm. um, GBD in Japan 2017. And this was exactly the period when Japan was, you know, at the beginning, around 2000, Japan was in the middle of bubble economy, very euphoric. And Japan bought Manhattan Island, as China does today. And then around 2011, uh, when Japan was hit by disaster and started to face the you know, low growth, economic growth and population aging. And my career in academic field was quite consistent with the social economic phenomenon which Japan faced over the years. So Japan really needed a new vision and healthcare and health system for the future. That was my, um, you know, I did academic work but what I really wanted to do is to come up with some sort of vision for the future. But in June, luckily, 2015, uh, four years ago, um, Health Minister Yasuo Zaki uh, tried to form an advisor panel for, to set up the vision for the Japanese health system. And just two weeks before the advisor panel was announced, the minister called me up. I, I never worked with the politicians, and I didn't know that guy. And, but he called me up and asked me to chair the panel. I don't know why. But I was very reluctant because, you know, I don't know the UK system about the bureaucracy. But these committees, the agendas are all often predetermined by bureaucrats. And actually, they guide all the discussion behind the scene. In the case of Japan, I don't know the US or other countries. So I said to the minister, thank you very much, but I'd like to decline your offer because if this is a usual government committee, there is very little I could do. 
both professionally and also intellectually. So, but he replied, no, 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 this is totally different. There is no hidden agenda. Everything should, everything should be discussed by the panel, and I will follow the recommendation. It was quite exceptional in the Japanese policy making process. In the UK, it's more. Really? <laughs> Are you sure? Well, well, no, in terms of pre established agendas. Okay. But that's important because, uh, because the agenda is there. So that's why they set up a committee to endorse that. But this time, it, it is about the vision. It's not necessarily predetermined. We need to think from the scratch to come up with a grand vision. So, of course, for specific policy, policy making purpose, I think that kind of you know, predetermined agenda would be important. But, um, so, but he was ser serious. So I, um, in the end, I accepted the offer. But in return, I requested three conditions from the minister. First, if the panel aims at the vision for the next 20 years, I said the panel members should be those who will be still active 20 years from now. So that is, they should be in the age bracket of 20 to 40. It's quite, quite unusual for the Japanese government committee because most of the time they consist of establishment big boys over age 65. So that's one request. Second is that the government committee consists of external experts only. Now I told the minister, but bureaucrats are those who know the key issues and face various challenges from members of parliament, Japan Medical Association, or other relevant stakeholders. So I like to let them speak out and also say whatever they think is right to come up with a grand vision. So I ask, so please invite the bureaucrats officially as a panel member. And he said, okay, it's quite an exception. And finally, it's a simple, Healthcare requires diverse view, so I ask the minister to include as many women as possible. So I just request three things. <laughs> so the key issues discussed in this healthcare 2035 was transform the healthcare into a social system that engages all sectors through shared vision and values. We propose simply three things. One is lean healthcare, that is to implement the value-based care. Second is life design to empower society and support personal choices. So we emphasize the importance of social determin determinants explicitly here because this is critical in the aging population. And finally, Japan to lead and contribute to global health. So here we explicitly stated that global health is a very important part of domestic health policy. So three visions, three, I call three L's, lean healthcare, life design, leader in global health, simple. But, you know, so with the experience of these over the past two decades, and I have come to the conclusion that there is a grand convergence in population health policy, research, and practices. So as I said, I chaired 2035 vision for Japan and I was very surprised to see this. You know, this is the UK 2040. Um, I don't know if some of you have read this, but uh, the vision and the approaches in this uh, 2040 was quite consistent with what we did in 2035. I almost thought, that, oh, they copy and pasted what we did. <laughs> no, no, seriously. But According to Robert Lecra, this report was the precursor of this Institute for Population Health. So I thought when I was uh, asked to take this post, I thought it's a kind of Disney. So uh, I was lucky to you work on this, but I knew that uh, in the UK here, the people are serious about this kind of you know, issues, social transformation of healthcare. <laughs> So the current healthcare system may, must be rebuilt and as a social system, and it should be shifted from public health to the health of the public.
across different agencies. So second, I like to talk about local global interaction. So you are the expert in global health, so I don't spend too much. But I like to discuss the local global interaction, and they actually share some common issues in quite a few countries. And one of the most important topics of population health today. Here is a slide, a website of Harvard University. I actually graduated uh, graduate school. I didn't go to you know, Harvard undergrad. And I had a chance to chat with the former president, uh, Professor Faust, who is the first female president of the Harvard University. But it, you know, do you know what is the most popular course among Harvard undergrads who are probably the most ambitious and smartest kids on the planet? Well, what is the most popular course among the Harvard grads? Of course, they have to uh, concentrate on two majors and one minor. What are the most popular two majors among Harvard undergrads, not our graduate students? Any idea? Sorry? Economics. Excellent. One is economics. What is the other? Law? Hmm? Law? Actually, sorry, not. Sorry? Political science? Not quite. Psychiatry? Hmm, sorry. No, it's, a, it's a graduate school course, so. Undergrad for economics is one. Hmm? Not necessarily, sorry. I, I love the philosophy. Medicine is for an, uh, graduate school. Right? Mm, not. <laughs> sorry? Health system? Health system is for Martin. No, 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 sorry. Not for undergrads, 20 a kid. Hmm? In general. No, but economics and what else? Social. Unfortunately not. <laughs> Economics is the rule of the game, right? Law is the fight of people and impose on it. But economics is not just accounting, no, it's not accounting accounting. It's the rule of the game of the rational people's choice. It's a game of the rule. Rule of the game, sorry, rule of the game in the real world of the rational people. So economics is a rule of the game. And what else do we need? The language. It's a computer science. Right? So rule of the game and language. So these are two most popular courses. So Economics 101 by Gregory Mankiw is the most popular, followed by computer science. So root of the game and language. So equipped with these two, you know, knowledge, and the skills, what is the most popular minor course I'm a Harvard undergrad today? Not today, when I spoke with Professor Faust a couple of years ago. Any idea? Exactly. Exactly. Grow a house. That tells you something, right? So, uh, global health, I, I, I thought about why. Because they, the Harvard undergrads are very ambitious. They just, want, they just don't want to be rich men or women. They want to change the world. And global health is the most cutting edge entity with a bunch of innovations. And actually saving lives. And market is growing. And of course Bill Gates is there. So I don't know, the bunch of reasons, but uh, it's, that tells you something about Global Health today. But anyway, when I decided to quit WHO, as I you know, shared with you, my mentor, Tachi Yamada, who is now a venture capitalist and previously the president of the Global Health at the Gates Foundation, once told me that, Kenji, don't forget Global Health is the future of medicine. And when I quit WHO 10 years ago, I didn't understand, quite understand what he meant. Because I, until, until that time, I thought global health is just for helping poor countries or technical transfer. But now, everywhere, it's global health. Local global context, interactions, issues, lack of doctors, 
you know, health system, integration, aging, population, comorbidities, as I said, technologies, globalization everywhere. And in fact, after the following the Healthcare 2035, we pushed very hard the linkage between domestic and global health context. Surprising Prime Minister Abe contributed to the Lancet. Did you know that? I don't know who wrote this, actually, but uh, he talked about three things. Japan, at the time when we had a G7 summit, and he wrote in the Lancet, Japan should contribute to the health security because we had Ebola crisis and WHO screwed it up. So we wanted to revamp the global health arch architecture to tackle global health security. Second is resilient health system for aging population. And thirdly, AMR, because of the request from Sally Davis. No, I'm just joking, but we wanted to put very high on the agenda, not for her, for the world. And Prime Minister, you know, wrote to the Lancet. Again, I don't know who wrote this, but uh, it was great. And we, um, at the G7, the order, most of them are gone, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately, the situation is quite different. But uh, uh, from that summit, we had a reform of WHO to set up a health security cluster. And also, you know, pandemic emergency fund at the bank and the SEPI for the new vaccine fund, and also UHC movement, and also AML, a bunch of stuff are now emerging since then. So again, to summarize the local domestic, domestic global interaction, in, 20, 12, in 2011, I wrote in the Lancet, as a part of the Japan Seas, that Japan should go beyond UHC universal health coverage and emphasize the social system approach. In 2016, uh, we wrote a recommendation to the G7 and in, about human security and health security, universal health coverage, uh, AMR. But these two pieces are more or less consistent in a sense that we need system thinking, we need local global interaction, we need to think about not just health but human security. We need to implement multidisciplinary approaches to tackle this. So finally, Give me five or six minutes before I open the floor for questions. So I started from my observation that um, you know, health systems are changing towards social system. And then I argued, you know, in front of Martin, it's a little bit tricky, but uh, you know much better than I do, but local global interaction are vital in many countries, particularly for you know, the UK or Japan, the US, in the domestic policy agenda. And let me conclude my talk by discussing the future of health systems and sharing my vision for the new institute. <laughs> and before discussing what I intend to do, let us take a look at a few examples of health system transformation today. The, some of you know this. This is um, uh, the report by Ernest Young uh, recently. So they think the life sciences are changing towards life science 4.0, whatever that is, I don't know what it is. But starting with blockbuster model, so previous pharma, let's think of a big pharma. They think are volume based. The more they say, the happier they are. So it's a blockbuster model, so it's too risky now. So they seem to diversify the portfolio, but still they are volume based, roughly, that part. And they, they shift to the shift the focused outcome. That's where we are, I think. But still, somewhere in the middle. But the next step is more on not only the outcome, but also share the value on the basis of data driven platform. That's the way life science should move. That's a report from the future vision of some of the uh, big thinkers in this kind of technologies. And also, in terms of education, a professional like you. I was an advisor to this um, very famous chair on the Frank report about transformation, transforming education for healthcare professionals, published in Lancet. And previous, uh, they argue that there are three phases in terms of health education. 100 years ago, Traxner report, 
which was based on science, and it's purely university based, all academic okay. program on science, like biochemistry or physiology, blah, blah, blah. And then in um, 1970s, PBL, problem based you know, writing, was introduced. And much of the you know, learning process was not the university hospital, but academic centers. They argue now that it's an era of system based learning. And important you know, content is competency learning and local global interactions. And where they will run this kind of thing is a health system, not just academic centers. That's what they are proposing. And also, before I just came, before came here, I was chairing this joint ministry committee, uh, the Future Health, organized, organized by two ministries in Japan, Ministry of Health and Ministry of Industry. It's very messy. But this is a, just a visualization of what we discussed issues. Inclusiveness, empowerment, self-achievement, personal, visualize, mind, visualizing mind, and investing in health, redefining health, blah, 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 a bunch of issues. But in terms of discussion issues, what we are talking about the future are more or less the same direction. Of course, the solutions are quite diverse, but in terms of issues which I identify are pretty much consistent. And so, again, and also last year, I saw a huge, huge uh, social transformation. For example, uh, 1961, uh, Japan achieved universal health coverage. Yeah. That was the beginning of our universal health coverage. 1961, President Kennedy did an Apple program. After how many years? 40, 47 years? No, no. 50 years? 57 years? This universal health coverage? And, you know, I'm very shocked by this announcement. Amazon, Berkshire, Hasse, Berkshire and also JP Morgan Health. So it's uh, industry is trying to develop their own healthcare system. I, I'm, I'm confident they will start new insurance across the country, if possible. But it's not, it, so I am very shocked by this in a positive way. It's not the country which runs the healthcare system. And, and also SpaceX, I'm not quite sure it's doing well, but what NASA did, was we would be replaced by a private company. I don't know. At a very low cost. I'm not arguing that private sector should dominate the health sector because of market failure and many issues. But these are happening on the ground. And in terms of monitoring things, we have a smartphone and then drones and automated car. But when I went to China, I was very surprised because so vendors are using fintech. They don't use cash anymore. Of course, here you can use mons or other things. But even the vendors, poor vendors on the street, they use not just this. There is, they don't use any machines. So if you go to Seattle, you know, Amazon Go, you don't have to do anything. You just pick stuff and go home. And then eventually, what will happen is our body will become a smartphone. So we will be our own doctor. So that is also the transformational change in terms of technology. So I, I will give us a little bit more example and then I will share my ideas. I visited India a couple of times last year as a Japanese delegate of the cabinet. And I met a bunch of new startups and one of the very important interesting things uh, is that is called Care, which is combining home-based care with Uber. India is pushing home-based care because they don't have much, many hospitals. Japan is pushing home-based care because we have too many hospitals. So the end, end goal is the same. Of course, the incentive are totally opposite. But anyway, the company used Uber to match the health workers to visit the patient home efficiently. And also in the U.S., the you know, U.S. is very notorious for inefficient health care and the long history of market-driven system. But I saw the future of community-based integrated primary care there in the middle of New York. It's an HMO type of venture, 
which enhances community-based integrated care by what is called health coach, advocate for health. It's a kind of task shifting to a health coach. But they not only take care of the patient at the time of sickness, but also they take care of when they are in, the, in their daily life. So uh, it's a great mix. And of, of course, they are really data-driven uh, entity. And data shows they reduce their cost and improve the outcome substantially. And a similar model is, is now happening in Kenya. I was very surprised. I, I was told by Tachi Yamada about this, which is called Empath. And this is the joint um, philanthropic approach by the Kenyan government and the Kenyan medical community with the U.S. Uh, universities. But they are showing great success at this stage. So what I would like to do, building upon the vision which we created in Healthcare 2035, I wrecked my institute with uh, established this kind of people-centered open platform and data-driven platform for well-being. And this kind of you know, concept would be quite crucial in the era of precision medicine and also at the time of no one left behind. So why King's is important for me? So I finish in three minutes. So this is another mentor of mine, who is Dr. Sweet from Thailand. And he's very famous in Grover House. And he's a yeah, real advocate of Grover House from Thailand. And he, he's very famous everywhere. And he said, Kenji, we need triangles to move the mountain. So he said, three mountains are knowledge and politics and society. Of course, as I said, knowledge comes from academic institutions, think tank, international agencies. Politics are not just for politicians or bureaucrats. Politics at King's as well, lobbyists, and budget everywhere you go. And social movement. It's not just um, consumers, civil society, industries, social media, and communication. And from my experience, I'm 100% supportive of this view. So currently, academic institution is like this. We have a bunch of knowledge. And here, um, you know, Body versus mind, individual versus society, local and global, and this is a system. There is a huge gap here. But at the Kings, we have South London. You know, we, we serve the South London, and as I said, there are four times population aging, comorbidity, chronic disease, technology thing, globalization. They are so acute in this area. And what we like to do here at King's is to bring this kind of research activities, policy making, and also kind of entrepreneurship, social movement together with you, and linking body and mind, as you are doing here, individual society interaction, and also local and global interaction, and this is an system interaction. That's exactly what King's should do, and that's exactly what I like to do with your support and with your and with and the collaboration. And last two weeks, uh, I, I was asked Dr. Tedros, who is a director general of WHO, to be a special advisor. I I was very uh, anti WHO, but I I love WHO now. <laughs> but seriously, the reason why he asked me to be his special advisor is that he liked to create a new bureau about the metrics and the system transformation. So that is exactly consistent with what I would like to do here. So I'd like to use this opportunity to work with WHO and other member states and bring this king's potential to the global level and add also the domestic policy making as well. I don't know anything about the UK, so uh, what I could do is to link this entity and with you and to make kings uh, more visible on the you know, global health and population health discourse. So I spoke about healthcare transformation and local global interaction and some of the vision I do. It's not yet concrete. That's why I'm talking to many people right now. But I'd like to emphasize uh, about this. This is uh, Rowling's uh, Harvard commencement speech. I was there, lucky, 
and I was very impressed. What she said, she said was, we don't need magic to change the world. We carry all the power we need inside ourselves already. So we have the power to imagine better. That's very important. So I, am, I love research, politics, social movement, but let's put aside the politics for the time being. And let's think about what we could do together. So I'm really looking forward to working with you, all of you. And thanks very much once again for coming here today. Thank you. I just want to make a correction uh, in the introduction. This is uh, an event jointly sponsored by our Center for Development and King Global Bank Institute. I've made a remission and hopefully so. <laughs> it's your turn to the questions. Okay. So thanks very much indeed, Ricardo. No apologies required. Uh, but mainly thanks very much indeed, Kenji, for that remarkable presentation uh, steeped in many years of experience in the fields of public health and global health, spanning into governmental institutions, governmental institutions, Japan, uh, and now to our great benefit uh, here in London okay. and in South London as well. Okay. So I'm sure everyone here would like to join me in saying you really are most welcome. Thank you. And we look forward enormously uh, to working you in this, with you in this area. And I think your presentation uh, amply showed that despite your, uh, uh, in addition to your uh, superb qualifications to take on the leadership of the Population Health um, Institute uh, at King's, there is of course this uh, important overlap between the disciplines of public health uh, and global yes. health, and we're planning to work uh, very closely together on that in the future. Um, I've got lots of thoughts in my mind with this very visionary presentation that you made, but I'd like to open it straight out to the audience uh, for any questions or comments that you might have for thank you. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. I think Andy, you were the first. Thank you very much, Kenji. really inspiring. Um, I just like wondered if you had anything to say about how um, the global north and the global south interact with one another, um, and how we can perhaps do better. So usually, for example, I'm advising WHO. Forget about you know uh, term technical transfer because it's a joint running process. So um, right now, for example, in the case of universal health coverage movement or health system strengthening. Uh, recently, uh, WHO sent a group of people in Kenya to do a workshop on health system building, but it was a disaster. So instead, I asked the people from a Thailand to go there and discuss and identify common agenda and come up with the you know, head of state memorandum of understanding level. So I think it is time to think differently how not just the South to South cooperation in a classic manner, but how we can enhance the you know, network of really competent group of people and work together and to support each other. So it's a beauty of global health. It's not just a North to South technical transfer. It's a mutual running process because the issues are the same. Aging, health system sustainability, financing, you know, technologies. It's not an issue of developing countries. Of course, the resources are limited, but the issues are not just about money. It's not just about the people. It's a more system issue, I think. And it's changing. It, it was interesting. I noticed that both in the UK statement and also in um, the Prime you, Minister's yeah, statement yeah, yeah, in the Lancet, yeah, yeah. they referred to global health security yes. uh, as their leadership role in, in global health. And I sometimes worry that that's a little bit reductive but it's kind of the Ebola thing, that the first thing that you do is But if stop you the sell the you global health to head of state, yeah. yeah, they say, oh, it's great. Then stop. Mm. Yeah, it, it's a little bit risky, but security matters. And yes. through that lens, I think the important thing is not just to sell, oversell the security matter, but also package it with the health system building yes. and you know, supporting on the ground at the time of peace. So that's what I wanted. So starting from the security, 
and sitting towards the health system. So we need both. Yeah, as a package. Thank you. Now uh, we have other questions from Paul McCrone and Peter and then so Paul. Yeah, thanks. It's a great talk. Thanks very much. Um, in, in many countries, policymakers are terrified about rising costs. Yeah. And so there's obviously there's loads of moves towards cost containment. Do you think that's misguided, or should we just accept that as economies develop, we should be spending proportionally more of our income on health and education and other things like that? Yeah, because in terms of public money and cost of containment should be a very big issue because it's a trade-off. But in terms of paying for healthcare, because the healthcare is shifting from, again, 